Hello everyone, I'll just give people a couple of minutes so everyone's got the chance to, to join. Okay, I can see we've got 45 participants now, so I'll just get going. Um, so I'm Lindsay Chalmers, I'm the Development Manager at Community Land Scotland, and I'd like you to welcome you today to our event, The Western Isles and Inspiration, which is the first in a series of Meet the Pioneers events. So we're going to be doing these, one of these events every month um, for the next few months so that people can find out what our members are doing. Um, it's great we've got so many people joining us today. I'm just going to run through a few kind of brief housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, so um, we are going to keep questions and answers to the end, but you can ask questions and answers as, as we're going through and as people are presenting. It's just we'll have a kind of chaired question and answer session right at the end of, of today. And um, you can ask your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom or through the chat box. Um, if there's a particular person that you want to direct your question to, just mention that um, when you ask, uh, and I'll make sure at the end that that person answers the question. Um, we're in webinar mode today, so you don't need to worry about accidentally speaking. Um, and finally, we're going to be recording the session today, and it will go out on our Vimeo channel along with all of our other videos. So um, if you want to watch it a second time or you feel really inspired and you want to tell other people about it, um, in a few days' time, the session will be will be going up on Vimeo. So why do we want to look at the Western Isles, first of all, in our series? Um, if any of you saw the Scottish Government report that came out a couple of weeks ago um, as part of their annual um, count of how many community landowners there are, you've seen that an amazing 71% of all community land in Scotland is in the Western Isles. Um, it really is kind of leading the way uh, on community land ownership. We always say in Community Land Scotland, wouldn't it be amazing if we could just put, put people on a bus and send them up to the Western Isles to see what's going on there? Because I think until you've really seen it with your own eyes, you can't really imagine what it's like to be in a place where community land ownership is the norm uh, and where so many people have so much more control over their future. So about three quarters of people in the Western Isles are living on community owned land now. We're going to hear three different communities today in Harris and Lewis, um, so three different stories of community land ownership. Um, so first up we'll have uh, Callum Mackay of North Harris Trust, um, who, they purchased their land in 2003 and they're one of Scotland's biggest community landowners. Uh, next up we'll hear the epic story of the uh, Park Estate, um, which really um, the community land motto of never give up couldn't be stronger than it was in the park estate. So Angus McDowell will be talking about their experience. And finally, we'll hear from Murder Mackay at West House Trust, which has um, really been leading the way on repopulation. So I'm going to hand over to Callum Mackay now and um, just feel free to stick any questions in the Q&A or chat. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Callum, I can hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? We can, yes. You okay. can see your slides as well. So we're ready to start, yeah? You are, yes. Okay, thanks. I'd just like to begin by uh, acknowledging that the slideshow I'm going to use today was not made by me, it was made by Gordon Cumming, who was the manager of the North Harris Trust about a year ago. So my thanks to Gordon, and slightly out of date, but uh, still relevant today. So as you mentioned, the uh, North Harris Trust was formed in uh, 2003, having bought 
the former North Harris estate from a private landowner. Okay, slide two. Um, this slide shows basically the area of land, which is the bulk of the land in this uh, slide, uh, excluding Scarp on the next uh, on the left hand upper corner, but including Scarpe, which is in the bottom left hand corner. In total, it amounts to about twenty six thousand hectares. Um, 70,000 acres in old money. And um, the, the, the dividing line between North Harris and South Harris is at Tarbert, which is more or less in the middle of the, the screen there. So south of that is South Harris, and to the left of that is Tarrancy, the island of Tarrancy, which is in the, the left hand side in the middle there. Um, half the land is um, in crofting legislation, either crofts or common grazings, and the other half of the land is just open uh, moorland, which is inhabited principally by a herd of red deer. There are about 800 red deer in North Harris, roughly. All right, next slide. As say, uh, I said there's about um, 70,000 acres of land in total. We've got a population of roughly 1,000 people. And one of the things we felt at uh, the beginning was that it would be uh, good to try in some way to address the depopulation which had been hap happening in Harris um, for 50 years or so in the throughout the island and a lot of the small villages were becoming de and are still are becoming depopulated uh, but it's a major problem it's a major issue trying to address that but uh, it's one of the the um, principal aims we had when we bought the estate we inherited the sporting rights which is mainly deer and uh, shooting on the land we didn't inherit the salmon and trout um, fishing that was bought by a private individual. We bought along with the estate, we bought uh, a few properties, a few houses and a few outbuildings. And a uh, two of them in particular and uh, the associated outbuildings have become in the recent years into a poor condition because they're, they're um, now about um, 140 probably years old. So we're, ju we're just actually sold these and we're hoping to use the money to build a couple of new houses. They were becoming a liability. We were renting them out, but uh, the estate houses themselves, but we've now just sold them off and we're going to build new houses with, with the money. We inherited a whole range of leases which enable us to have a, a steady income um, year on year. They're, they're long-term leases. They're, they're with different companies all over the place. There's a whole host of them. Some of them are quite substantial, relatively speaking. Um, some of these are with, uh, for example, with fish farm companies and others are with um, energy providers and so on. So we have a, a, a steady source of income every year, which is fairly stable and fairly reliable. Some of our principal aims, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, depopulation was a major issue. So we um, obviously were looking at housing provision, looking at um, trying to support organizations in providing employment, retain people here, and maybe there I a, delivering some local direct employment ourselves. Obviously having such a large area of land, we are looking at enhancing and improving the natural heritage. And um, something which has become more and more important in recent years is uh, making a contribution to improving local tourist facilities. 
as we see more and more people coming to visit Harris year on year. Okay, next slide. This is basically uh, an overview of the setup we have. We've got a voluntary board of regional directors. Regional means that the directors are spread geographically throughout the whole state to ensure we, we, we uh, decided early on to have this approach so that all areas of the estate will be represented on the board of directors. We've got the main um, company and we've also got a trading company with separate uh, directors. We've got subcommittees, we've got a property and land subcommittee, we've got a finance committee and we operate a development fund which puts money into local we businesses in the community or into community groups um, every year. Um, we we, we um, spread some money out into the local economy in that way. Within the, off, within the staff, we have currently a manager. We have a crafting and land administrator, a senior development officer, a projects development officer, a ranger, and we also run the local recycling facility on behalf of the local authority. The local authority give us money to um, uh, run the local recycling facility. And um, we usually employ two people there, but at the moment, at the moment it's down to uh, one, one person um, employed there. So that's the current setup we have. All right, next slide. Some of the things we've done, housing has been a, a, a feature. We um, built our own offices at the bottom of the, in the middle, in the middle of the slide, there's a photograph of our offices and uh, we built them about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And um, initially we were renting offices, but then we built this building right in the middle of Tarbert, right in the heart of the estate. And on the ground floor, we have offices and a boardroom. And above that, we built two flats, which we rent out to local young people in the community. We also, a few years ago, bought in Scarpe, uh, a care unit which was no longer being used by the local health board and they put it on the market so we bought that and uh, we converted that into two houses a two-bedroom house and a three-bedroom house and we rent these out to two local families the top left hand corner shows eight uh, social housing units which were built by the local housing association we campaigned for a number of years to get these built. We held discussions with the Hebridean Housing Partnership, who are the local uh, social housing providers. We provided the land there out of common grazings. It was basically rocks. It was no use for a uh, craft work, for grazing or for cultivation. So we negotiated with the local um, grazings committee we got the land released and on it, beside it, beside these eight houses, there are two private, three private house sites, which were sold off as well. When we put the facilities in, the amenities in, we decided that the um, area of land was sufficiently large to have uh, three private houses on it, as well as the eight social housing. So we provided that a few years ago. At the moment, we're looking at another site in North Harris in order to build like two houses on it using the money that we have just acquired for the old houses I mentioned earlier, the old estate houses, which we have just sold. So um, providing house sites for individuals also has happened quite a lot um, out of, out of um, croft land or out of the uh, land we just own ourselves. So some progress has been made, but there's a lot to be done yet. One of the principal problems we have with housing here is the huge cost of a building. It's at least a third 
higher than it is anywhere on mainland Scotland. It's substantially higher even than it is in most of Lewis, particularly around Stornway. Uh, one of the main costs is that the main builders for any large projects have to travel down from Stornoway or from somewhere up near Stornoway more or less every day, and that puts up the cost. But they, <coughs> it's something we're still working on and hoping to make progress in the future. Okay, next slide. Um, support for businesses in the top left hand, in the left hand corner there, are three business units we built in East Tarbert. And we were aware of the fact that there was a demand, and there still is a demand, for uh, business units. So we got these built a number of years ago with support from uh, High and from lottery funding. They're busy all the time. In fact, one of the businesses in one of them has expanded quite uh, substantially and are now not just working in Harris, but throughout Scotland, actually. And we're looking at sites at the moment for building further uh, business units and we're getting some feasibility work done on that at the moment. Uh, on the right hand side, there's a photograph of Scalpy School. Now we rented that for a token rent from the local authority when the school closed. And we had uh, five or six wee businesses in there paying us rent for a number of years. However, the, the, the colony decided uh, two or three, three or four years ago that they wanted to dispose of that school permanently. They wanted to sell it. And we were given the option of buying it, but uh, have, having investigated, um, the sums just didn't stack up. It's an old building, uh, outbuildings that are in a very, very poor state. And so we didn't go ahead with our purchase of that. So unfortunately, Scalpy School is currently not used by anyone. And I mentioned earlier the Community Development Fund. We, we, we've we given uh, some money to local businesses over the years, and some of them have, have grown quite, uh, quite large over the years. All right, next slide. Um, community support, that, that shows, that just shows the local um, recycling depot, recycling facility, which we operate. And apart from doing recycling, we sell animal feed um, for crofters and fencing materials and um, a number of other things such as, I don't know, I can't remember, wood briquettes and things like that. Um, we've got a wee uh, unit which converts cooking oil into diesel fuel for vehicles and um, it's run um, on behalf of the whole of Harris really and it's a well used resource. All right, next slide. Community uh, renewable developments, a number of them have taken place over the years. We have quite a number of we wind turbines we own ourselves and they generally feed into specific um, uh, businesses. Like for example, we've got a couple uh, feeding into the uh, community recycling facility. We've got another two or three in Hushnish, which run the um, tourist uh, center we've built in Hushnish. And on the left-hand side, you can see three fairly large wind turbines above uh, Artasic. They're not owned by the trust, they're owned by an external company. We, we get a land rental for the land they're on. And for, we got a, we got, we got initially we got paid for the land that was taken out of us, out of uh, common grazings. There's one, um, the, we've got one um, hydro scheme on the estate, which is um, adjacent to the old whaling station. It's not actually owned by the trust, uh, we, we, we get some money for rental again. At the moment, we have the option of buying into that or buy, buying that, buying the, the scheme. But at the moment, uh, that hasn't happened. We're considering options on that. Um, 
while, while, while talking about worth it, um, maybe also worth mentioning that we've got a whiskey distillery on North Harris have, have had for about four years, and uh, we get money for all the water that they use. So the more whiskey they make, the better as far as we're concerned. Okay, next slide. Um, estate management, we work closely with crofters on, on uh, estate management and with MNC Castle Estate, which is the private landlord who bought the castle and the fishing rights. And there's a picture of, we shouldn't really be advertising MNC Castle. We should be getting paid for doing this. Um, that's the bottom left-hand corner. As I mentioned earlier, we have about uh, 800 red deer running around the hills and we lease out the stalking of the stags mainly to MC Castle. And we set up a stalking club, a deer stalking club in North Harris many years ago. And we have 25 members and the members are able to go out deer stalking and get one or two deer themselves legally. And uh, that's been a, uh, quite a unique development, I think, for North Harris the um, Deer Stalking Club. We've got, uh, I can't remember, 170 crofters on 26 um, town, crofting townships. So the, the, the crofters appreciate having a landlord who is right on their doorstep, that many of the directors are crofters themselves and they're not dealing with uh, the landlord they don't know and uh, with agents that they don't know. Okay, next slide. Uh, natural heritage, we're involved in a lot of things. We've got, we've got uh, something like 33 miles of paths to maintain in North Harris. There are quite a, quite a lot of uh, options for walking in North Harris. We do a lot of paths maintenance, either uh, by contracting the work out or by um, working with volunteers. We work very closely with SNH. We work very closely with uh, John Muir Trust. Um, 81,000 trees were planted with us, well out of date now, it's a lot more than that now. And uh, we've got uh, three, three or four forestry schemes in North Harris. And um, we're always working with the um, crafting community in terms of monitoring, grazing and so on. Okay, next slide. Um, Natural heritage. Well, on the left is uh, an Eagle Observatory we built out in the hills uh, many years ago, and it's very, very popular. A huge number. It's quite accessible. Um, half an hour walk from the main road for 40 minutes uh, along a path, and thousands of people visit it every year. We have a ranger who organizes outdoor walks, outdoor activities. We've been running for a number of years now the Isle of Harris Mountain Festival annual festival and um, we engage a lot with volunteers in the local community get them to help us with past maintenance beach cleanups all these kind of things all right next slide um this is part of uh, another important thing we do working with young people we have uh, a ranger who goes into the schools and uh, into the school and uh, tells youngsters about the natural environment. We take part in enterprise days. We're taking part at the moment in our rural skills course, which is taking place in the secondary school. We've done over the years the Crofting Connections projects and uh, trying to encourage uh, young people to be involved in the estate as well. Although it's not easy, it's not always easy to do that, but we have to look to the future. Um, okay, next slide. Um, before I finish off, um, I'd like to mention tourist developments. Um, a number, three or four years ago, we built a tourist uh, facility in Hushnish. Uh, it's called the Hushnish Gateway Building, and it's got facilities. It's got a place where uh, visitors can sit, and it's got showers and toilets, etc., and camper van hookup points. And we're looking more and more to provide these kind of facilities as more and more people come to Harris. We're looking at a couple of potential camper van hookup sites at the moment. We operate two waste disposal units 
um, for camper vans in North Harris. And we, we, we hope to provide more and more facilities of that nature. So in conclusion, look, I would say you, you um, have to look to using the skills you've got available within your own directors and staff within the local community, try to get as many people involved as possible, look to wherever you, you can to uh, get support funding, work with partners from both within the state and externally. We work very closely with the local authority, with HI, with the uh, SNH, with the John Muir Trust, with Coma Nagarik, Board Nagarik, all these kind of organizations have always been very, very supportive. You can't do it all on your own. It's better to work with a partner on anything you want to do. Okay. Thanks, Callum. That's fantastic. It's just amazing to see the huge range of work that the Trust does in North Harris. Um, so we're going to move a bit north now and head to the Park Estate, where we're going to hear from Angus McDowell about um, how the estate is developing there. Angus, I think you need to unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. I think Harry's just going to. Um, can you turn your do you want to turn your video on as well so we can see you? If I must. <laughs> Thanks, Angus. Uh, good morning, all. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Well then, <clears throat> well, um, Park Trust has got uh, a very similar history to, in some respects, to what uh, we've just heard from Callum Mackay, but it's un uh, Park Trust is unique in its own right, as, the, as all the, the buyouts are. So a lot of what Callum said there uh, we relate to, but uh, I was going to focus more on uh, a bit of the history for um, how we came to purchase the estate because it was, it was the initial uh, steps by the landlord of the time that uh, uh, pretty much forced us down the route that we went. So, um, like everything, you have to start at the beginning. So, uh, in the, uh, at the start of this uh, process, uh, way back in December 2002, uh, our landlord's representative uh, at the time, I'm sure most of you would have known him, he was a local lawyer, um, but he uh, got in touch with all the the common grazings in the district and invited uh, a representative to come to a meeting in Graver. So we were all there, or most of us were there anyway, to hear the story of what the landlord and the um, Scottish and Southern Energy had decided to do on the estate. And they were looking to build 125 turbines uh, um, here and it, it progressed the, the, um, the not quite to planning but uh, to whether applications were going to to the Scottish government for uh, acceptance um, so we got invited along so that we would hear the, the story and uh, in their view, the good news story about the income that would come into the district. Um, it was very substantial. Uh, it was, uh, to the affected crofters, it was going to be £438,000 per annum. 
but the the problem that we faced was that it wasn't every crofter that was going to benefit and this led to us uh, to the ultimately to the reason that we formed the the park trust in December 2003 and we had uh, been given significant help with HIE um, talking to us about the process for a buyout. We very much wanted a voluntary buyout but um, at the end of the day that's exactly what happened but uh, it was a long route to get to there. So the the Scottish and Southern came to visit the community, tell us all their good stories about what they were going to do for us and what have you. Um, some of which proved to be not quite what we thought when they were talking to our community. We presumed the community benefit was for our community, but in actual fact, it was to be spread over um, the council area, uh, a, a proportion to the council, the uh, Western Isles, a proportion to the neighbouring communities and the remainder to park. Uh, whilst we had no objections to further afield uh, getting benefit out of it, our main uh, problem was that uh, it was the affected crofters on our estate that uh, um, were, were the only ones that were actually going to benefit. So we would have had a very much divided uh, community uh, where there was the haves and the have nots. Uh, <clears throat> so, like I said, we started the, the process to buy the estate. We spoke to the landlord to see if it was available on a voluntary basis that most definitely wasn't well well maybe that's not quite true it, it was available voluntary um to, to purchase but we were only the, the landlord had um created this thing called an interposed lease and the estate at that time was owned by park crofters limited and they hived off all the rights of the estate to this uh, interposed company known as Park Renewables Limited. And Park Renewables had the right to run and maintain the estate for the next 50 years, if I remember, and with an option to extend it for another 50. <clears throat> so whilst we, we could buy the land, we were just buying a shell which gave us no, no, uh, gave us nothing at all, other than we would have ownership, but ownership with with no, no ability to do anything, because part renewables would be the, 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 the body that would decide what to, what could or could not happen on the estate, you know, because initially when Scottish and Southern came to the uh, and the landlord came to the community. Um, we had we weren't even a consultee in the, the community. wasn't a consultee because there was no 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 body there at all. Like what Park Trust became eventually. So in a way, uh, when we realised all this was happening and it went to court and. Um, uh, we, the government won the, the battle there with the, the estate or, and um, so, <clears throat> so then we had a, a ballot of the community that was, we were assisted by uh, the land unit, in particular Sandra Holmes, uh, uh, Sandra I believe is listening in today, but uh, um, Sandra was absolutely essential for us, as is the, the whole of that team today. And, uh, you know, one thing about going forward is that 
uh, any community that's looking to purchase their estate or a property or whatever it is, there's assistance out there for you and great assistance is there. Um, like uh, was said to me one day, you'll never get anywhere until one or two of you take up the mantle and run with this and push it forward. Um, so if you use the assistance and you've got people in your community that's willing to sacrifice uh, some time to make this happen, uh, I believe it's totally well worthwhile. <clears throat> so anyway, um, we had our first ballot and uh, I was never so nervous in all my life as I was the day of that ballot. And, uh, but the, the, when the numbers were getting, it was the council that ran the ballot for us. And when that um, uh, came to a conclusion, uh, there was almost 80% support, both from the crofters and from the community for the buyout. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was close to 80. So it was uh, a big relief that day. Um, during the course of the time of the buyout, we actually had three ballots for different reasons, but the results were very similar on each one of the ballots. So that allowed us to uh, progress to uh, the next stage, which was to put in uh, our part three application. We uh, did that. Again, we had uh, great assistance from uh, all sorts of uh, organizations and people, both individ individuals as well, in helping to, to get to the stage of putting in our part three application. That part three application was actually never granted um, uh, by the government. It sat there for um, a good many years whilst uh, the Land Reform Act was changed and um, further discussions were ongoing. There was a, a space, in, there was a time in a, around about 2000 and seven, eight, nine, if I remember correctly, that um, it, there was just little or no movement in that time, but yet the wind farm was also not progressing for various reasons. Um, the, the wind farm eventually got uh, refused by the government, I believe, um, for whatever reasons. But uh, we, we carried on. There was a, a few people on the board that uh, were very determined. And it was those people that, uh, along with the rest of the board, um, uh, by the way, the, we had a board of 10 um, people who were voted on by the community. Um, and uh, all played their own part in uh, uh, coming to the final conclusion of ownership on the 3rd of December 2015. But uh, we uh, had held numerous community meetings uh, along the way. Uh, as Callum said earlier, it was so important to um, take the community with us. Um, I believe we we did that uh, successfully. We had uh, various meetings, both um, public ones and where we went round the various villages and talked to the individuals in the village on more on a one-to-one -one basis so that those people that didn't really like to stand up at community meetings uh, didn't feel intimidated and um, we had, our membership was um, uh, close to 70%, if I remember rightly, of the population of Park at the time. Um, we have 400 people in our district 
and um, <clears throat> so it was uh, we seemed to be well supported obviously there was people against it for different reasons but they were in the minority and the majority thankfully won the day uh, there is There's a huge story to do with the, the buyout and it's, it's more like 20 hours that would be needed rather than 20 minutes. But it's, uh, it's fascinating in its own right. Um, I hope no other community has to go down this route uh, that uh, we did. Uh, but the legislation is there and the legislation is there to be used and uh, it's it uh, when we about 2009-10 we started going down a slightly different route we called it at the time the twin track route and we kept sorry I missed a bit there we actually got agreement out of the landlord to uh, consider a voluntary transfer rather than um, uh, go down the part three route. Um, so the landlord wished for us to drop our part three and carry on with a voluntary, but we refused. And uh, we said that we would carry the both the voluntary and the part three route together and this actually was proved to be uh, the best we could have got out of it um, <clears throat> with the, the, the part three hovering over the landlord at all times and we only got to this stage because of support from huge support that we had from government agencies, um, various organisations, but the changes in legislation made it more and more difficult for the landlord not to sell. And um, so when he did agree to that, we uh, made, uh, uh, had various meetings with them and again there's a gentleman on here today I'm not going to mention his name in case he wouldn't be happy but who significantly helped uh, that process in getting the two bodies together the landlord and park trust together um, in a hotel in Harris and <clears throat> uh, uh, without that uh, involvement it may not have progressed, who knows. But we um, went down the route, we've had the, the land valued two or three times, it never changed really very much in the, the various valuations. But eventually we agreed on um, a sum of £500,000 to buy the 28,500 acres of the estate. There was two areas that we were not able to buy at the time. One of them was for the converter station, the proposed converter station uh, that was going to be built in Graver for Scottish and Southern to transport the electricity off the island. That didn't happen um, because Scottish and Southern and the landlord uh, could, couldn't agree on the payments. Uh, for that land and then Scottish and Southern moved their their um, location to Arnish should it ever be built. The other area is that uh, beside uh, the it's in the far southwest corner of the estate it's a piece of land that uh, um, the neighbouring estate tried to buy off the, the landlord of the time but that sale has never gone through um, Park Trust has got the option to buy that at some point, and I would like to think that we will take up that. I think we have to wait. We have to wait five years, if I remember correctly. But um, uh, I would like to think that Park Trust will buy that eventually, so that the estate is back to its former size. 
So as I said, we made an agreement with the landlord to pay half a million pounds for the land. Um, we had, Park Trust had f funds that it had uh, gathered and uh, put together, um, which, which we had to use uh, in total for the, the, the buyout. Um, so we had uh, just slightly over uh, £300,000 in the bank by the time we uh, agreed on the sale. And the rest of the money came through um, Scottish Land Unit and HIE at the local council. The local council uh, gave a huge amount of help um, from senior level down. Uh, we were never refused um, assistance, Some, not always monetary, but um, various assistance. And it's good to have friends. And I think Callum said something that to work with people. So we tried very much to do that. And we have tried very much to keep the community on board. It was very difficult at times because at times there was so little happening, but nonetheless, we, we reported as often as we could. Um, <clears throat> so we uh, uh, got to the stage where it was agreed in April 2013, I think it was, sorry, May. Uh, 2013 and we moved on from there to um, to map the estate that was part of what we had to do it was a huge task but one that is uh, was so well worthwhile we now have a map that has accurately as possible <coughs> Uh, shows all the land that is, has been bought from the estate since way back in 1878, I think it starts, and uh, to date, and we have all that on file and a copy of the records and it's mapped as well. It's a hugely important document for our, our estate. And this only came about because of, one, because of the legislation, um, changes and uh, uh, also because of registers in Scotland, uh, their requirements. So I believe it was the first estate that had to do that. I don't know if Benny had to since the, on that scale, but um, it was a huge project. Um, and again, we have people in registers of Scotland that uh, gave us very significant help. Um, <clears throat> and that will help us for many years in uh, the future. Um, so we, uh, we eventually bought the estate on the on the third of um, of December two thousand and fifteen. It was a particularly wet and stormy day, but it was uh, met with uh, much delight. Um, and at that point we gave up, or just prior to that, uh, we gave up our um, part three application. It had to be rescinded before we could uh, complete the buyout, which it was. Um, so part trust uh, had, it was uh, a long journey it had. It had a, a good many directors in that time um and uh, we had the chairs that were there uh and the, the always took up the mantle of uh running with the show um it was very difficult at times but um it came to the as far as we we're concerned the right conclusion at the end of the day um but very quickly, um, we have um, done quite a number of the things that Callum was talking about, maybe not to the same scale, 
We bought the care unit in Graver. We converted it into two houses. You'll see that on the top right hand slide. Um, sorry, uh, the top two pictures rather. Um, we have um, just been awarded the funding to buy the, the resource centre in Kirchter. You'll see that in the bottom slide. It's a, a building, a Y shaped building on the right hand side. This was built in the early, about 2003, I think it was. Um, we have uh, various uh, projects, we've done walks, some walks rather, and uh, we have uh, uh, a park walking group. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, various leases uh, with fish farm companies uh, to do with peers and such like, and uh, telecommunications and we have increased the income into the estate quite a bit and we are certainly hoping to extend that by a significant amount in the in the months to come uh, which should leave Park Trust uh, in a financially strong position for the future. Um, <clears throat> We also have looked into what's known as a pump storage hydro scheme and that we had did the first feasibility on that. It concluded last late last year um, because of COVID it hasn't really gone much further but it's restarted just in the last couple of weeks and we hope to be uh, uh, going and knocking on the doors of our friends looking for assistance to take that forward in the near future. Um, we employ uh, one full-time uh, state uh, manager, that's uh, Fiona, and <clears throat> we have one other person on a part-time basis who is uh, digitalizing all the estate records that go way back, including uh, so that each croft will have uh, all the, the letters and documents recorded digitally and um, <clears throat> the common grazings and various other bits that land has been taken out of for whatever, out of the estate for whatever reason. So all the estate records will be digitalized. Um, I think that's about halfway through. It's, uh, when you look back on these records, it's uh, very interesting. So um, I think that's really uh, all I would uh, like to say at the minute. Um, so thank you very much. Speak with you later if you've got any questions. Bye. Hi Angus, thanks for that. Um, I had the pleasure of being up at your Gravier Housing for the housewarming last year. I got to meet your very happy tenants and also eat some very delicious cakes. So happy memory for me. Um, <laughs> So we're going to move on now to um, Callum, sorry, Marjo, who's going to be talking about what's been happening in the West Harris Trust since they're by it. Hello, thank you. Are you hearing me? Okay. I hear you loud and clear, Marto. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I'd like to give credit to Linda for preparing this slide for our previous um, presentation. Linda, our manager at West Harris Trust. Um, there's some a, a few updates from when the presentation was presented, but I'll, I can go through that as we go through the slides. Uh, so on to the next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, the area of West Harris. Um, I can give you a little bit of history. Um, the area was actually pri previously sort of between the wars and 1920s, it was uh, two private estates and a farm that had been cleared um, 
probably 100 years previously. So there was no actually townships there um, less than 100 years ago. It was compulsively purchased by the government uh, in the early 1920s and then resettled uh, between the 1920s and the very early 1930s. And it had been owned in the government ownership since that time, apart from uh, a, a farm, one farm in Scalister that was uh, taken into public ownership in the 1950s. So the whole area, unlike North Harris, uh, was actually government owned. Um, but you'll see later on in the presentation what drove the community to consider um, taking over the land for themselves. So next slide, please. Okay, this is the West Harris Trust. This is the structure. We have a board of directors. <coughs> um, it, we weren't using the 2003 Act to purchase the estate. We used the 1997 Crofting Estates Act, and um, which was slightly different. But part of that uh, almost compelled us to to have a structure which is actually very good for the situation that we have in that each township or each grazings um, is represented on our board. So we have 10 directors and the grazings committees are always represented. Um, so we've got a good geographical spread um, of directors included. We've got a commercial manager, uh, we've got an administrator, a community engagement officer, although that's out of date at the moment, but another one is being um, employed as we speak, a janitor, a cleaner and an admin assistant <clears throat> and we have also had additional help during the summer months time basis. So that's the structure of the, East, the trust and that's how we operate. Um, we have monthly meetings and the sort of role of the directors has been fairly intense when we're doing a lot of um, building works but in the last couple of years, we're more in the stabilizing, I suppose, mode. So the, the intense activity of the first few years has, has quieted down a bit. Um, we'll do the next slide. <clears throat> the aims of the trust, to revitalize the community by attracting new residents and creating new housing and employment opportunities. And you can see some of the developments in the pictures in this slide. We've got a community enterprise centre on the left. That was the cutting of the turf at that centre um, about five years ago now. The school in the third picture is uh, Shillibus School, which was the only school on West Harris, uh, although it was open at the time of the buyout and was a driver for um, motivating the community to consider the buyout due, due to the dwindling school goal. Unfortunately, it couldn't be saved, but um, we were able to buy it off the local authority. And then that's the picture on the far right is the affordable housing that's built next to the Community Enterprise Centre. If we go to the next slide. Okay, as I mentioned uh, at the opening, uh, what drove the community to consider buying what was, some would argue, already publicly owned land was the sustainability stats that you see here from the population that we, we had just one uh, under five, one, one preschool child um, in 2010. So the, the writing really was on the wall, not only for the school, but for the community. And there were no business spaces at all for let. Uh, there was no council housing on the, in the West Harris area. Uh, there was no private rented housing and there were no community facilities, there was no community centre um, like you would see in quite a few other communities. And I suppose the point that sometimes, a, although something is in community ownership, or public ownership I should say, it doesn't always mean that it's 100% in the community's favour. So although the land was publicly owned, since the 30s, it really was, uh, it had overseen a, a period of some significant neglect. And uh, well, the, the crofting side was possibly the, the driver and what motivated the management of the estates. It didn't, um, it didn't provide for the regeneration required and the new population so that the population was 
I think at the time averaging well over 60, <coughs> the active crofters. And it still probably hasn't improved much on that, although it has improved quite a bit in terms of the overall population, but the age of average, average age of crofters is, is still uh, not sustainable. Next slide. And this is one of the projects that the West Hallis Trust has brought forward in partnership with the Hebridean Housing Partnership. Uh, you can see the four affordable house plots in the picture there. And there are another two to the right that you can't see in the picture that have now been completed. Although these six houses there are um, rented, the four new ones uh, at the moment are um, shared equity, affordable plots, um, sorry, building the new, new house is exactly the same as that design there to match the community enterprise center that you see in the far left of the picture. You can also see right to the far left, one of the campervan hookup spots uh, that have been built to complement the center and provide additional income to the trust. And on to the next slide, please. This is uh, the completed community enterprise center. As I said earlier, there were no facilities at all in West Harris where you could, where a business could set up, rent a space or where the community could meet. So this building has four um, units that can be leased by businesses uh, on the left. It's got a restaurant that's leased uh, to an operator. It houses the state's office and also a rentable office. And to date, it's been, it's been very successful. The, the actual build was supported by a lottery grant, a HIE grant, and uh, Scottish government and local authority assistance as well. And the overall cost of the building, plus some of the housing infrastructure, access roads, etc., was about 1.6 million, if I remember rightly. And go to the next slide, please. Um, much as, as Callum has mentioned, the increase in uh, tourism in North Harris and in West Harris, we've seen a similar increase over recent years. And the West Harris Trust is trying to do what it can to improve the facilities available and the occupancy for all this developments that we have created has been very good, as you can see from the slide here and also it's provided some valuable income for the trust over time helping us to achieve a, a sustainable business model going forward. Uh, next slide please. This sort of just um, in a way it's, 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 a, it's a work in progress but uh, in the 10 years since by uh, I think we've demonstrated that um, you know, especially affordable housing um, allows people to settle in the area and we've seen quite a big jump especially in the under fives and in the population as a whole and that's very encouraging. Uh, we've seen a, obviously a big jump in the business spaces for let. That includes the ones built at the community enterprise centre but also spaces available in the school that was purchased and also um, another building that was built uh, specifically for by the trust for rent and that's rented out to another business. I'm afraid there's no pictures of that particular building in the slides. Um, you've got I mean, the social housing there, the private rented housing and the dedicated community facilities. Uh, so that's uh, our, sort of the evidence of our activities over the decade so far. Next slide, please. Our aims are to create environmentally sustainable energy for the community via small hydro and micro wind projects. So let's say, like North Aris again, and like many other community bodies in the Western Isles, we have been able to take advantage of some very generous feed-in tariffs and um, grant support for putting in renewables projects and they have been crucial to the success and the 
income for the trust. I mean, they provide a valuable source of income. Uh, next slide, please. This is a bit more information about the, the actual renewables. We've got three wind turbines, a joint capacity of 158 kilowatts, which isn't huge in comparison to some of the community trusts that have put much, much bigger turbines in. But in West Harris, we are constrained by topography and uh, also geography. Some of the biggest turbines wouldn't really get onto the network without huge cost and complications. But I think we've done what we were able to do with the constraints on us. And also the new centre that you saw on an earlier slide, half of the electric for that. And some of the houses is sourced from renewables and the turbine above the site. And that picture there shows a school visit to one of the turbines. So the kids getting in information on development and renewable energy projects. Next slide, please. Again, this is another of our aims to conserve and increase the understanding of our stunning natural heritage. Um, West Harris as a unique, I suppose, uh, Macher area is. Uh, unique worldwide, but um, I think Scotland and Ireland have the largest chunk of Machar anywhere in the world. It's the, it's the area that has sort of thin soils, but it's got sand blown. Um, the the Machar is the sort of, it's a Gaelic word, but it describes those sand dunes and coastal heath areas that are um, renowned um, both nationally and internationally. Uh, next slide, please. Land management, in cooperation with North Harris Trust, we've done beach cleans and the John Muir Trust volunteers have helped us. We like to encourage responsible outdoor access, so there's been guided walks. Um, we've had a engagement with our grazing committees on responsible muir burn practices. We have a limited sporting some shooting and some um, uh, brown trout fishing that we have managed. And also there is a copper fishery on the Luskintar stand that we have been involved with trying to manage more effectively. Next slide, please. And this is another of our aims to enhance the education of the community of West Harris about our culture, heritage, and history. And these slides demonstrate that slide on the left is an old monolith, um, Clough MacLeod standing stone on the Hargobaras Peninsula. And there's community events there. That's the inside of the community space in the enterprise center that you saw. And then the next slide is one of the walks that have been organized and another community event. In the, in the restroom part of the building that you can see on the far left slide. Sorry, far right slide. Um, next slide, please. What's next? Well, sustainability, renovation, it's the old school close up. Um, Looking, we have looked at renovating this and improving it for uh, additional or enhanced uses, and that work is still ongoing. We have actually, that's then one of the updates from this, the date of this presentation being prepared, is that additional hookups have been put in, another additional seven hookups with assistance of the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund. They are all ready, and I think within a week of going live, they were all pretty much fully booked for the season. Um, Talanamara extension, we have looked at extending the enterprise center to allow for larger events. We have a, a sort of temporary, uh, it's a, it looks like a sort of marquee, but it's actually fixed to the building when it goes up. And it goes out to the front of the building and there's a lot of work involved in putting that marquee up and down and also in a, such an exposed location uh, it's very very weather dependent 
So if we have a wedding that's dependent on the marquee, it can be a bit of a nail biting experience to know when it's exactly able to put up and take down. So we have looked at a more uh, permanent structure to replace that marquee or to make the building a bit more usable for the large event. We're still looking at affordable housing. Uh, like North Harris, we have considered building houses ourselves, uh, or buying uh, where we can. Uh, that's not something we've done yet, uh, but one we've, we're keeping a, a close eye on whether it's something we would do in the future. We're involved with um, HIE on the rollout of uh, fibre uh, in the area. The rollout is going well. I think most of West Harris should be connected to fibre optic by the end of this year. And we're also looking at our community share offer to buy out the hydro scheme that was done in cooperation with a private developer. And there is an opportunity to possibly do a community share to buy that out, which would increase the community share of that and over time increase the income from it. So that's the end of my presentation. And like the others, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Marjo. I mean, just amazing across the three organisations, the range of things that you're doing across job creation, housing, culture, community, um, quite inspiring. So um, we have a few questions. Um, so can I just ask Angus and Calm to unmute themselves? Callum, you talked a bit about um, deer stalking on the estate. I just wondered if you could maybe talk through a bit why it's so important that deer numbers are controlled uh, in Harris. <coughs> well, we we um, have a, an agreement with SNH uh, with regard to the managing of the natural environment. Deer, deer have been here for um, well over 100 years. Um, in the areas that we know them now, anyway, they may have been there, goodness knows how much earlier, but uh, when we, uh, we need to have grazing on the land, basically, but we also need to manage the grazing on the land. And uh, over, over most of the hill land in North Harris now, uh, deer are the only grazing animals we have. In days gone by, going back uh, to, beyond 20 years ago, there were thousands of sheep grazing the hills of North Harris. But that number has significantly reduced now. And the area over which the sheep graze has significantly reduced as well. So we, um, we do a lot of grazing management, monitoring, grazing monitoring. And um, when we bought when we bought the estate, the, the, the number of animals on the hill was much higher. This is almost 20 years ago in terms of sheep and deer. And there were areas over the estate where it was um, felt that there was a lot of overgrazing. And so the monitoring over the years has demonstrated that, um, first of all, something we know that the number of animals grazing has decreased. However, um, it also shows that the quality of the grazing has improved. We, we've got a more diverse range of plants in particular growing. So we have, as I said earlier, uh, an agreement with SNH that we will monitor the natural environment. And um, part of that is managing the deer herd. It also, the, the deer are, a, a source of income for the trust because we lease out the deer. So properly managed, it's a resource we use for managing the natural environment, but also as a source of income. Okay, thanks, thanks, Callum. Um, I'll be um, ask the next question of you first, Mardo. Um, it's a question from you and Alison just about kind of repopulation and what your thoughts are about kind of the potentials for job creation and economic creation for people beyond kind of the worlds of crofting, energy and tourism. 
you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I suppose given the rollout of um, fiber, there has been a surge in interest in people who've suddenly realized over the last few months that they can work from anywhere, that if they can do so, then they would maybe like to work in an area like Harris. And Lou, that, that's across the board, I believe, in the Western Isles. So that certainly would be a departure from the traditional, although it's been on the, on the cards for a, at least 20 years. Um, I think the HIE had an, a, an initiative um, certainly more than 15 years ago, but live local and work global was the tagline. Um, it never really came to much, but I think now uh, there is an opportunity to maybe to build on that. And um, I think you might see more people doing that, working from home, working remotely and maybe choosing the remote, remote locations to do so. And guess are you finding the same in the park estate? <clears throat> Yeah, we believe that um, a lot of the houses that were for sale in the district have been snapped up just lately. And uh, it's good to see because uh, we're um, very much want to see people move into the district uh, because without people, there's, there's no district really, there's no community. So yes, uh, uh, I totally agree with what uh, Mordo had to say there about uh, uh, people uh, up looking to work from home. I'm being, I'm one of them, as it happens, mostly. And Calum, I know that we get asked quite a lot of Community Land Scotland about, you know, creation of affordable housing and, you know, is there any point in creating affordable housing with, without putting investment into jobs? But I think in North Harris, your problem is that you've got jobs, but there's just nowhere for people to, to live to take up those jobs. Is that right? Um, one of the issues we have is finding appropriate places on which to build. Despite the fact that we have 70,000 acres in total, um, a lot of the, the land is not actually appropriate for our building on, largely because you don't have the local the sources, like you don't have um, um, access to um, electricity supply, quite often, or um, running water, or um, able to dispose of sewage. And if you look at the Round Tarbert, for example, many, many people are looking all the time for uh, land in Tarbert on which to build houses or on which to build units for, for business. However, we're very, very limited around the Tarbert area and what is left of land in which, on which to build. And um, if you're looking at some of the more um, remote areas of the estate, it's, it's quite difficult, very, very, it's quite often very, very expensive to put uh, housing, to, to, to build. We've just got, got prices for housing over the last year in different locations over North Harris. And um, the cost is just prohibitive. You just can't do it. Immediately you build, you're into negative equity. You're never going to get the value, uh, house at, at its actual value, built at its actual value. But we're working closely with the Housing Association and with the Corley to, to see what can be done. Um, maybe when we're on that subject, um, we've got a question from Audrey about um, the kind of tension between how, you know holiday homes and creating housing for full-time occupants and maybe you could talk us through North Harris, how do you manage that tension? Is it about creating more houses for rent? Is it about building houses with rural burdens? How are you How are you looking at that in North Harris? Uh, it's, a, it's a Scotland, I suppose, worldwide potentially problem. You know, you're, 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 um, there's something over which you, you um, quite often don't have much control in, in terms of who buys a privately owned house. You know, you, you, you can only manage what you can actually have control over and uh, with, with uh, the North Harris what we're comp campaigning to do really is to persuade the local housing association and the local authority to build more more houses um, 
we are we have done things like shared equity in the past with local particularly young people and um, the local authority also has an empty homes officer who is charged with uh, looking at where there are empty homes which can be brought back into usage. So we, li we liaise with the local authority in that way as well. But often, who buys a house as sold privately, e even the, the local uh, landowners don't have any control over what happens. So it's not just a question, it's not just a problem here, it's a problem um, in many, many rural areas. Angus, I know um, housing development has been a priority for you since you purchased the land. Are you finding similar um, issues and are, are both of your housing developments houses for rent? Um, they are for, the houses are for rent um, and we are finding exactly the same things uh, as Callum uh, stated earlier. We had uh, the housing HHP round along with the local authority to look at various sites on the estate and for nine times out of ten it was the, the cost of providing the, the services, the electricity, the water, the sewer that uh, just prohibited these developments going ahead. Um, but we are hoping to I'll change that. We have just started uh, looking at another project um, that uh, we may be able to do uh, further housing at on the estate. Um, this is just at the basically the embryo stage at the minute but uh, if we don't have houses we won't have people and you know our school like the school in Sheilabost is in great danger of closing um, the, the local authority is looking at that at the minute. I think the time scale is sort of two years down the road, but um, it's a, a very negative thing for the estate uh, for that to happen. But without a school, you don't attract so many young people in, and without young people, um, it, the community just gets more and more aged. But it, it's um, so we're want to try and do our bit to um, provide uh, some more housing. Uh, well, hopefully we will anyway. So yes, it's uh, uh, an uphill struggle to get people in and uh, there's little or there's very little rented accommodation on the estate that uh, is uh, it's mostly just um, people that have bought in and there's holiday homes and various things. But, um, so yeah, it's quite a problem, not just here, as Calm said. Murdo has been a certain two bedroom house in West Harris has been all over social media in the past week. Um, what, what are your thoughts about the long term solution to lack of housing in house? Um, uh, Pretty much along the lines that Carl Miang mentioned, there is very, there's very little you can do on um, the houses that come on the market. Uh, what we can do is affect the houses that we have supported. So any sites that West Harris has sold directly for housing and affordable house sites, we've had um, a burden on the title, so they can't be resold uh, for second homes or holiday homes. So in perpetuity, these are uh, permanent residences. But we can only effect that change on land directly sold by the trust. Uh, we can't apply that retrospectively to any sites so, uh, on Crofts. That's uh, it's just not no power to do so. Um, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I suppose longer term, maybe uh, the, the change, a change in planning is probably the, the answer. I know, uh, I'm not sure is it Devon or Cornwall, but some area down in the south, as, as in, I think it's a 40, 30 or a 40 percent maximum second homes cap on um, you know, houses in a certain hotspot areas. And I, I suspect that's probably the way forward and um, we can constrain, but even that will have unintended consequences so that you would have 
prices possibly rocketing in the <laughs> neighbouring areas. So it's very difficult. Uh, we've seen that with crofting legislation where they tried to, um, the 2010 Act that was supposed to limit speculation by uh, you know, stop, stopping speculative decrofting. In reality, all that's happened is that the heat has gone from the house sites to the actual craft tenancies. So they're now inflated in price. So it's really, uh, really quite difficult to find a way around that in a free market economy society. So I, I, I don't think there's any quick answers, but certainly increasing the housing supply. And that's one of the issues in West Harris and in North Harris. Uh, the cost, uh, I can give you an example. We had a survey done probably about a year ago where the HHP were looking, that's Hebridean Housing Partnership, were looking at that site that they could have developed in partnership with the West Harris Trust. So we had the site surveyed and uh, I think HHP's limit for um, affordable development that they can back is about 120 to 130,000 per unit built. And that would be as sort of semi-detached. The feasibility study that we had done uh, for the site in question came in at almost 250,000 per unit built, which is way, way out of uh, the range that they could affordably build. And as Calvin said, in, you know, you're immediately in negative equity territory. Nobody can back that, so no one can finance that build. So these are really, really difficult issues. Um, I know some communities, uh, I think it was in Mull, I saw a link to um, these sort of modular type builds that might be a, a solution. Um, I don't know enough about it, but I think some sort of innovative um, thinking along those lines is possibly the only way forward at the moment. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a subject of ongoing discussion at Community Land Scotland as well, because it's such yes. an important thing for so many of our members. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming up but, to the end, but can I just suggest if everyone is okay that we maybe run a couple of minutes over, um, just so we can get a couple more questions in, and then if anyone has any burning questions that we don't cover today, um, you can just email them to us at Community Land Scotland. Um, so an interesting question from Ian Callahan, who used to live in Harris. Um, do you, what, the feeling of the two, two of you who live in Harris and um, the decision against the quarry, um, many years ago, is the settled feeling there in Harris that that was the right decision? So maybe I'll ask that of you first, Murdo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, and I'm not 100% I'm not sure. My, my own, I, I used to work in aquaculture at the time of that inquiry, and I, I actually had to give evidence because we had a, a site very close to it. Um, so my, my own opinion was sort of, I, I wasn't opposed to it. Um, I still think it would have been possibly an opportunity, but um, I'm not sure. Certainly the, um, the unemployment in Harris, and that's prob probably related to the earlier question. It's not good for any economy to be totally dependent on any sector. And you, could you can see the issue in Harris uh, and in the whole of the Western Isles actually being too dependent on the visitor economy. So there is a strong argument in favor of broadening that economic base um, pretty dramatically to, to be able to sustain any future shocks. And COVID is just one of them, but there could be others um, down the track. So that's all I would say on the matter. Mm -hmm. Callum, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Well, I think it's very difficult to answer that question now uh, after the event, because um, you're not uh, expressing an opinion in the same way that you were when the uh, matter was proposed 20 or whatever it was years ago. But as Murdo said, um, opportunities come and go. And uh, the um, employment situation in Harris now is completely different to what it was 30 or 40 years ago and even 20 years ago. You can't really anticipate very much what could potentially happen. For example, well, we couldn't have anticipated five years ago that there would be a whiskey distillery, well, 10 years ago, but there would be a whiskey distillery along the road employing 41 people. There's another business which didn't exist in Tarbert um, 10 years ago employing 30 odd people. Uh, so opportunities come and go. Um, 
there's no doubt that the quarry would have an impact on the immediate area in terms of the natural environment. Uh, it would potentially have created jobs, don't know how many, but um, different, um, the situation is constantly changing and different ideas are coming up all the time. And uh, it's difficult, as I say, to give a, an impartial view on the super quarry idea now, 20 years later. Okay, thank you, Calm. Um, a question for you now, Angus, just about um, how you would um, advise other communities about um, situations where you're really having to kind of keep going against the odds. What tips would you have for other communities in that situation? Oh, it was very difficult, certainly, for us to, to keep going at times. But uh, there was always, there was always wee things that happened along the way from various people or people saying things that encouraged us. And to, to move forward today, you know, there's a lot of uh, people, organisations out there, you know, the councils, uh, their own organisation, HIE, the government, who are, I've got people there that are very able and willing to give assistance to groups that are looking to buy their land or buildings or whatever it happens to be. And uh, it's, I think the most important, one of the most important things that you need there is to be able to take your community along with you um, and trust uh, in their, uh, when it comes to a vote, trust in them. So by doing that, you have to put out the information as honestly and concisely as possible and you will get the backing as long as it's a proper, well-structured proposal. And as I said earlier, uh, lean significantly on those people these organisations that can offer help. They are, in, they, they are out there, these people, and uh, and as I said earlier, it was said to me at a, after a one meeting we had in Edinburgh that, uh, you know, until one or two directors of Park Trust grabbed the thing by the, 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 the proposed buyout by the scruff of the neck and ran with it, we would never, um, it would never, it would just trundle along very slowly without that happening. So that is actually what happened. And uh, that has, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, made the whole thing move along faster. But taking people along with you, your community is absolutely the essential first step. And then, uh, getting the or other organisations to, to, to back with you and run with you and work with them to, to get um, and I And I totally believe it was uh, is a well worth um, um, thing for a community to do because it gives you control. We were being dictated to um, right at the beginning now, now the people of this community can make their own decisions as to whether we have a wind farm or a super quarry or anything else in the district. So I think it's a, a for any uh, state, it's well, really well worthwhile doing that. Okay, thank you, Angus. And we'll just finish on one last question, which is for you, Murdo, about the new businesses in West Harris. Um, Bill Slee is asking, were they completely new businesses or did they move into new premises from existing businesses elsewhere? Do you know how much was additionality and how much was displacement? They were all new businesses apart from one. One was a, an architect's, uh, one of the four business units is an architect's office. They were an existing business. The other businesses are all new. Uh, that's fantastic. Thanks. I mean, there's a couple of questions we've not covered, but I'll get back to those people um, individually. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to Angus Murdo and Callum for taking time out today to share their stories. And thank you to Kerry, who, my colleague who's behind the scenes making all the presentations and everything happen. 
Uh, our next Meet the Pioneer session is on the 29th of, of October at 11 a.m., which is going to be focusing on renewables. So you can find information about that on our website. So a big thank you again to everyone, and thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Thanks. Thank you.